Okay, we're good. Promises, promises. I, I purposely put the song standing on the promises at the end because we're going to talk a lot about promises this morning. But we got to first, and Vinny, I need you on the computer advancing the slides, all right? I'll try so my best. So first, we're going to go through our, our words, right? We're not going to go through all the details. We're just going to do the main signs. So, so we walk, walk through these 14 major events of the Old Testament. We start with roots, route, rot, rain, ruin, oh, yeah, restoration, realization. Those are our, our words. And in that, we are in roots. We had the four great events. We had formation, fall, flood, and families, right? That's where we stopped last week. But, well, no, last week, then we, in, we started with the four main characters, or four main persons. First, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So we're on the second one, which is Isaac. Well, we're kind of bridging. Because to talk about Isaac, we still got to talk about Abraham. And we got to talk about the promises God made to Abraham. I tell you, one of the things my girls would always let me know is if I didn't fulfill a promise. Dad, you promised. Dad, you said. Anybody, any other parents have that issue? Their, their kids, you know, you said, I'll do something, and then you forgot about it or whatever, it didn't happen, and you were told. Yeah? It's easy to break a promise, whether by intentional or accidental. There's sometimes when you don't do something because simply you forgot about it. Anybody here have that problem? I have a good forgetter. I do. I will forget I said something. And, or I'll, I'm also a bit of a procrastinator. Anybody else a procrastinator? I know that some people are. Samantha's not a procrastinator. I am. Oh, Tiffany's a procrastinator. Chris is wanting to make sure everybody knows Tiffany's a procrastinator. And now everybody on Facebook Live knows it too. Okay, wait until the last two months to do the PE courses you need to graduate. Yeah, okay, Lee's a procrastinator. That's Nobody's okay. Nobody's watching it though. So sometimes promises get put off and aren't taken care of right away. I want to be known as somebody that is a person of my word. I think all of us do, or at least most of us do. If you say something, you want people to believe you, that you're going to do it, that you're telling the truth. Abraham was given a promise by God. Do you remember the, the elements of that promise? He was promised, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you children. In fact, Abraham, look at the stars of the sky, God said. Look at the sand of the sea. Just like you can't count the stars and just like you can't count the grains of sand but on the seashore, you won't be able to number how many kids I'm going to give you. It'll be innumerable. And Abraham, I'm going to do it Sarah. Sarah and Abraham were old. God wanted to make it clear that he was faithful. Do you believe God's faithful? Do you believe that if God says he's going to do something, he'll do it? Do you ever act like he won't? Somehow, what our head knows and what we actually do can be two different things. 
there was a bumper sticker that was popular back in the 90s, I think it was, that says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Anybody remember seeing those? Yeah. I always say I don't like that bumper sticker. Me too. The middle line needs to be scratched out because it doesn't matter whether you believe it. You can disbelieve what God says he will do, and he's still going to do it. You can discount it. You can shove it aside as Abraham and Sarah did. But God's still going to do it. Abraham and Sarah decided to take it upon themselves to fulfill God's promise. Sarah wasn't able to have children, and so Sarah gave Abraham Hagar, his, her servant, her handmaid, to be a concubine. And she bore a child named Ishmael, and Abraham loved Ishmael. Abraham begged God to fulfill his promise through Ishmael. Abraham wanted Ishmael to be blessed. God said, no, it'll be through Sarah that a son will be given. And that son's name was Isaac. God did a number of things to try to show Abram that he was a God that would keep his promise. The first thing we want to look at is, is in Genesis chapter 17, and I did not put all the passages up because they're, they're really too long for me to put everything on the screen. So we're, I'll, I'll read them to you. Genesis 17, in the first nine verses, God gives to Abraham a new name. Abram, a new name. When Abram was 99 years old, Dad, that makes you look young. He's 88. That's 11 more years. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord God appeared to him, saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell face down as God spoke with him. As for me, my covenant is with you, and you will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram, but your name will be Abraham. God changed Abram's name, which meant exalted father. To Abraham, which means in Hebrew, father of a multitude. God is saying in the very words, the very name that he is going to call Abraham now, that I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be the father of a multitude. I don't know about you, but father of four is enough for me. You know, when you go down generations... We were just together with my dad's four children, I'm the youngest, their children, and their children. In just three generations, there's, there was 40 of us from six in the home I grew up in, right? And that multiplication continues, and when you live, when you live as long as Abraham, 140 some years, I think, wasn't it? 180 years? I think. Okay. He had a lot of kids. Not just Isaac. But he, after Sarah died, he married again and had more children. Uh, if you didn't know that. He did have become the father of many nations. He continues, and he says, um, I will make you, verse 6, extremely fruitful and mit and will make nations and kings come from you. I will keep my covenant between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations and everlasting covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. And you and your future offspring, I will give the land where you are residing. All the land of Canaan is a as an eternal possession and I will be their God. God also said to Abraham, as for you and your offspring, after you throughout the generations are to keep my covenant. This is my covenant which you are to keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every one of your males must be circumcised. We're going to come back to that in a minute. He also 
we're going to jump down to verse 15. He's, he changed Sarah, Sarai's name. God said to Abram, as for your wife Sarai, do not call her Sarai, for Sarah will be her name, and I will bless her indeed. I will give you a son by her, and I will bless her, and she will produce nations. Kings of people will come from her. And really key in that verse 15 and 16, where God says, Sarah, which means princess. Sarai, I like this one, meant contentious. Every time God said Sarai, or Abraham said Sarai, you're, you're contentious. You fight. Yeah. Now, now, you're a princess. From you, kings are going to be born. From you will come royalty. God says, I'm keeping my promise. Just look at what I'm going to do. I promise you, children, I promise you that I am going to give you this land. I promise you that I'm going to make you this great nation and I'm going to bless you. God also gave them a sign, an outward sign for this covenant that he's made. And it's the sign of circumcision. Go back to verse 9, or verse 10. Every one of your males must be circumcised. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a sign of the covenant between you and me and you. This was a symbolic representation of the promise that God made will come true. That they would carry in their bodies this symbolically was to throw away, get rid of what was and to have that outward sign. Now, it's interesting down in verse 26. I, I don't know about you, but I might want to think about that for a few days. Any other men in the room agree? Nobody's, nobody's wanting to talk about it. I might want to think about going out and, and not only being circumcised myself at that age, 99 years old, but putting every male in my house through that pain. But I want you to notice something about Abraham. He, on that same day, verse 26, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised and all the men of his household both slaves born in this house and those purchased with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. Abraham did not hesitate to obey God. It's interesting to me that Abraham believed God. In fact, the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed that this was what God was going to do with his whole heart. And yet, there was one little part when Abraham couldn't make the promise happen himself. Sarah couldn't get pregnant. That he took it upon himself to make the promise happen by going into her concubine. He still believed that God was going to do it. But somehow he needed to help God ever feel that way? I do, a lot. Yeah. I know that God has promised, and I know God is doing things, but there's a lot of times when I feel like, I, well, God, I just need to help you. I need to do this, or do that, and, or do this other thing, to, to help you along. But God, you promised. I believe the promise. And sometimes we feel like it's a failing of ourselves, that God isn't working. And it's not. Here's the problem. My kids, when I would not fulfill my promises soon enough, would make sure I remembered them. Does God forget his promises? Is God's time the same as ours? 
No, in fact, God is not bound by time. And some of the promises he made to Abraham won't be fulfilled until the millennial kingdom. Interestingly enough, some of them won't be fully fulfilled until yet future. Does that make God a procrastinator? That doesn't procrastinate. He does everything right on time. Everything right on time. God promised that a child would be born through Sarah, verse 16 and 17. Abraham didn't believe that that was possible. Chapter 17, verse 17. Abraham fell face down and he laughed. And he said to himself, can a child be born to a 100-year-old man? Can Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, be give birth? So Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael were accepted to you, acceptable to you. But God said, no. I'm not going to do it your way. We're going to do things my way. Abraham wanted to, to, to well, come on, God, I, I, I've got the solution. Just, just accept what I've done. No. What you've done was not right. Interestingly, Abraham should not have ever gone into Hagar. Abraham, Ishmael should have never been born. Amen? But God, for Abraham's sake, chose to bless Ishmael anyway. When we do things that we're not supposed to, and then God chooses to bless anyway because of his son, we need to be careful not to assume that the thing we did was condoned by God. Just because he's now blessing. Because he blesses based on other things. Blessing doesn't mean God thinks that what we try to do out of our own flesh to fix things is the right thing. Does that make sense? God said, I'll bless, bless Ishmael. Verse 20, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will certainly bless him. I will make him fruitful. I will, I will multiply him grateful, grateful, greatly. He will father 12 tribal leaders, and I will make him a great nation. But, but, I will confirm my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time next year. When he finished talking with, with him, God withdrew from Abraham. Abraham took his son Ishmael and circumcised him. God also gave a special relationship to Abraham. I, I, I put it one way, I put it this way. The Son of God comes to dinner. What would you do? If the Son of God was coming to dinner, would you put out your finest china and fix the best meal you could ever fix in your life? Chapter 18. In my Bible, it's entitled Abraham's Three Visitors. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent during the heat of the day. And he looked up and saw three men standing near him. And when he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet him meet them, and bow down to the ground. Then he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not go past your servant, but let the water be brought that you may wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a bit of bread so that you may strengthen yourselves. This is why you have passed your servant's way. Later you can continue on. Yes, they replied, do as you have said. So Abraham hurried into the tent and said to Sarah, Quick, knead three measures of fine flour and make bread. Meanwhile, Abraham ran to the herd and got a tender choice calf and gave it to a young man who hurried to prepare it. I don't know how you can hurry to prepare a cow that was on the hoof one minute and you're putting on the table the next. Nor can you hurry to make bread when you haven't even started it. 
except maybe on 11. This took hours. And they prepared one of the finest meals they could, and I don't think even at this point Abraham knew who he was entertaining. It is customary to this day for the nomadic people, the Bedouin of the land of Israel, if you go into their community, they will entertain you in this same way. You go in and they will sit down and they will, they will lavish gifts upon you. They will give you some of their coffee that if you put a, a fork in it and stay standing straight up, it's that thick. They will feed you. and They are some of the most hospitable people in the world. You know, Israel has tried to get them to live in houses for years. In fact, Israel built a whole community just for the Bedouin to live in. And they moved, they moved them there, and the Bedouin pitched their tents outside, and their goats lived in the houses. I'm dead serious. <laughs> this is the way they choose to live. Abraham was a Bedouin of, of sorts. He was a nomad. And here he's sitting in the cool, the heat of the day, under this tree in the door of his tent, and he sees people walking. And my friends, this area of Israel is no different than what we live in, the climate we live in right here. And can you imagine yesterday, about 3 o'clock, somebody traveling on a long trip and out in the middle of nowhere, and you not offering them a cup of cold water? Abraham did what was normal and natural. It turned out that these visitors were two angels and the pre-incarnate Son of God. Before his coming to Bethlehem, in the Old Testament, we see who would become Jesus, the Son of God, the second person of the God, and appearing multiple times in the Old Testament, usually under the title, the Angel of the Lord. And you can always tell, like when Gideon saw the Angel of the Lord at the, at the wine press, he was threshing wheat, you know, throwing it up in the air, going, trying to get the, the chaff out of it, you know, because he's down in the wine press, there's no breeze. Who was, he, who was he entertaining? The Angel of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, we know it was Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, because... He accepted worship. Gideon put, put in a sacrifice on the stone and he went up in, into the, the smoke that was ascending and disappeared. He accepted the worship. Only God will accept the worship. But the servant of God will always reject it because I'm just a servant like you are. So you can always tell if there is an offer of worship, an angel will always reject it. God will always accept it. Here, pre-incarnate Christ comes to dinner. Abraham took curds and milk and the calf he had prepared and set it before the men and he served them as they ate under the tree. <coughs> Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked. They're in the tent, he answered. The Lord said, I will certainly come back to you in about a year's time and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent behind him and Abraham and Sarah were getting old in years Sarah had passed the age of childbearing, and so she laughed to herself. After I have become shriveled up and old, and my Lord is old, will I have delight? The Lord answered Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Saying, can I really, can I really have a baby when I'm old? Is, it any, is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will come back to you in, in about a year, and she will have a son. Sarah denied it. I did not laugh. And she said, because because she was afraid, but he replied, no, you laughed. <laughs> Abraham and God had a special relationship. Remember, this is before Moses wrote anything of the Pentateuch. The only thing Abraham had was the oral traditions passed down by his fathers. Abraham very likely could have known Ham, Shem, or Jacob. Probably Shem. Noah died the same year, that he, or right about the same time that, that Abraham was born, if you look at the charts. It's, it's fascinating. God spoke directly. God came in the form of his son, in the person of his son, to dinner. Continually reinforcing the promise I'm going to do it through Sarah 
I'm going to bless you and give you children through Sarah. But Sarah's old. Doesn't matter. Is anything possible with God? My friends, sometimes our faith is too small. We were, we were uh, visiting the first church I pastored in Hudson, Michigan. A little story about we, we were, uh, the building was under construction. We were adding on a, um, about a 3,000 square foot addition to the 150 year old building to add restrooms that were actually decent and so forth. And, and because it was under construction that summer, we couldn't do vacation Bible school. And so we decided we were going to do a one day event in the park. And we were going to call it WWJD Day. Does everybody remember the What Would Jesus Do movement a number of years ago? We were going to call it WWJD Day, and uh, we were excited, and we decided we needed to prepare for 50 kids. Now, this is a little church that barely had 10 kids coming at all. Not even. And one of the older men in the church was given the task of building bird feeders. So yeah, little craft kits, but they were gonna they were gonna cut the wood and plexiglass and everything. Grandma, Grandma Ship had one in her front yard, one of these for for years and years because one of my girls gave it to her after they were done. Had to be Janae. Janae would be the only one that was old enough, I think. Anyway, Susan said, "I want you to, to prepare for 50." And Leo Huff, bless his heart, said, "Oh." We're not going to waste all that material. There's no way we're going to have 50 kids. You're having it that park clear outside the town. That we don't have that many. How many did he want to do? 15 or 20? Like 20. I'll do 20. He says, no, you'll do 50. We're going to have 50 kids. The day came, and the kids started coming. And they came, and they came. And guess how many kids we had? 150. No, we had 50 kids. I was like, there was, I was one, yeah. one craft for every child and not one extra. And Mr. Huff was sweating it out as the kids kept coming and kept coming. And he, he came up and says, I don't think I have enough faith. Now, honestly, that's not real faith because God didn't promise us 50 kids. That's just, that's just hope or intuition. Or, you know, my wife's good at that, by the way. Desire. I don't have faith. for this week, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Real faith is based on the book. Real faith is based on what God says. Abraham had something we don't have. God told him directly. And yet, multiple times in Abraham's life, he failed to Isaac was born nine months after that event. And God fulfilled the first step of his promise. But God wanted to continue to build Abraham's trust. By the way, Birth of Isaac is chapter 21, if you want to read it. I'm not going to go there right now. We're going to go to chapter 22. Here is the son of promise. And God says, I'm going to test your faith. <coughs> this account that really happened should never be understood that God wants human sacrifice. God wants us to sacrifice our living self. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. God doesn't want you to put yourself, put somebody on an altar and kill them. He wants you to put yourself on the altar and live for him. Wholeheartedly. God wanted Abraham's heart. He wanted Abraham's trust as if Abraham shouldn't already have given it wholeheartedly. God wanted Abraham to prove to himself this wasn't about God knowing that Abraham would trust him. This is about God instilling that in Abraham. 
God already knew. Let's just make that perfectly clear. God didn't need to learn anything from this test. Abraham did. This was about Abraham and even about Isaac. As a young man, the impression, young boy even, the impression this event had to have on Isaac's life. I'm not, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of the uh, broad. God says, Abraham, verse 1, take your son, your only son, Isaac. Interesting, God is emphasizing that only son. Whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him. There is a burnt offering to me on the mountains I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning. Abraham got up. He brought everything for the sacrifice. But he didn't have a plan B. If you know me at all, I usually have a plan B. If we're doing something, I have already thought about the backup plan. The, 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 what, what happens if this goes wrong? I usually have a plan B, what, what we're going to do instead. That's the way I think. Abraham didn't bring a plan B. He didn't bring along a ram or a sheep or, or a goat or, or a cow to put on that altar. He and his servants loaded the donkeys with the wood, and they went to the land of Moriah. By the way, <coughs> the land of Moriah and Mount Moriah, where this event happened. Today, sitting on Mount Moriah is something called the Dome of the Rock. In, in King Solomon's day, sitting on Mount Moriah was the temple. Abraham, God brought Abraham to the very place where his temple would be built and sacrifice made and where his son would offer himself. Because this is truly a picture of what his son would do on the cross for us. So he saddled his donkey, took with him two young men, and set out for the place. When they got there, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. Now, now listen carefully. The boy and I will go over there to worship, then we will come back to you. Abraham had tremendous faith that God was not going to leave his son dead. Abraham believed that he was going to kill his son. Walking up there, Isaac asked the question, Isaac spoke to his father, verse 7, Abraham, and he said, my father, uh, his father Abraham, here am I, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked together, and when they arrived at the place God had told them about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. Now, this would have been, there on Mount Moriah, Underneath the Dome of the Rock is a rock. Interesting about that, named that the Dome of the Rock is covering a rock. It's the highest point of Mount Moriah. Whenever you built an altar, you would build it on the highest point of the mountain. That happened when, when uh, Elijah built the altar on Mount Carmel. They, built, they went up to the highest point of Mount Carmel, and that's where they built the altar. Uh, some say because that you're closest to God. For whatever reason, it was always built on the highest point. That is the same rock that Solomon put the altar on hundreds of years later. And you can go see that rock. I've been in there. You can go see, and you can see all the carvings where they chiseled out to set the stones and build the altar. It's fascinating. Uh, the Muslims control that today, but there's a day when that's going to be back under Jewish control. But 
there'll be there'll, there'll be Zoom sacrifices. In the millennial the millennial kingdom, there'll be no need for sacrifices. But the Israel the, the Israelites will resume sacrifice. He built the altar. He put the wood on top, and then he bound his son Isaac and placed him on top of the wood. Now, how old is I, is Abraham at this point? Oh. Hundred and one, huh? Hundred and twelve. Hundred and twelve years old. They're thinking his son's about twelve years old. I don't know about you, but I think a twelve-year-old might be able to overpower a hundred and twelve-year-old. <coughs> the Bible doesn't say a thing about Isaac resisting his father. Wow. Abraham bound Isaac and put him on wood. Pulled out the knife and was in the motion of bringing it down when God called out, Stop! Because God had taught Abraham and Abraham had learned and Abraham in faith believing that God could raise him from the dead, Hebrews says was going to take the life of his son instead there was a ram caught in the thicket there was a ram provided as a substitute. Just as Jesus became our substitute in that same place, just over the hill on Mount Calvary, Jesus took our place. That we might live that we might be in him. That we might be qualified, made spotless by the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Abraham in faith believed God. Do you? Do you take him at his word? Do we believe what's written in the book and do it? The Bible says Peter preached to the to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, be saved from this perverse generation. I was reading an article about how perverse our generation has got. How pornography, this article is about pornography, has invaded the church. We're called, and there's one name written under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. Do you believe, God, that Jesus Christ took your place on the cross, that you deserved death, that you were a sinner? Under the judgment of the Creator, and that only through the blood of Christ can we be redeemed? Most people in here say amen. amen. Have you followed that up with obedience? In the waters of baptism? It isn't about getting saved. It's about telling everybody else. It's about following Christ. It's about doing what the word says. It's obedience. I think in August, I'm hoping we're going to have a baptism service. I've got at least one that I believe wants to be, to be baptized. We're going to do it before the pool gets cold. <laughs> Maybe there's some others that need to be baptized. And I believe God calls us to become part of the local church through membership. If you haven't done that yet, I would encourage you. We desire for you to be part of us. Amen? God has promised us Many things, I think, of Ma in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Condition, seek first. Put God as priority. And all these things will be added to you. 
Uh, some would say, anything you want, no. All, health, no. God doesn't promise us to be healthy, wealthy, or wise. He promises us that we will have what we need. We will have what we need. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can trust you. That we can trust your word. That we can believe it. But Father, we fail so often. We say we believe it and yet we act like we don't. We say we, we know you're going to act, but yet Father, we somehow believe that we have to do it for you. We've accepted the lie that God helps those who help themselves, help themselves. That's not in the book. Father, help us to trust. Help us to believe. And like Abraham, take action immediately on what you've called us to do. Help us to give you all the praise and the glory for everything you do, Father, and not keep any of it back for ourselves. In Jesus' name.